Well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I really look forward to hearing this presentation as well as some people were talking about. So I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers today. So we have Sue Abrams, who is a teacher of genocide studies, social psychology, and human rights at Avon High School. He has been awarded the Krasnick Fellowship for Excellence in Holocaust Education by the Greenberg Center at the University of Hartford. He's also been awarded the prestigious Mandel Teacher Fellowship from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in 2000. <clears throat> Excuse me. He was selected as the 2009 to 10 Teacher of the Year for the Avon Public Schools and was a semifinalist for the state award. <clears throat> also in 2010, Mr. Abrams was invited by the USHMM to travel to Poland with nine other American educators to discuss the future of Holocaust and genocide education with their Polish counterparts. In 2011, he received the Prudence Crandall Award presented by the CEA Human and Civil Rights Commission. Most recently, he's contributed a chapter to the new textbook, Understanding and Teaching the Holocaust. The title of this chapter is Memorial Monuments and the Obligation of Memory. And then we also have David Pettigrew, who is a professor of philosophy at Southern Connecticut State University, where he's taught since 1987. He's created a course titled an Introduction to Holocaust and Genocide Studies, Stories of Resistance, Rescue, and Survival, which is, he's been teaching since 2013. He's a member of the Connecticut Advisory Committee on Holocaust and Genocide Education. And <clears throat> we'll introduce some other workshops later on in the program as well. Um, you might have noticed that Allison Noria is not with us currently. She unfortunately has an unforeseen matter that needs to be attended to but hopefully we'll get some materials that she has prepared and I will send those out to everybody after the program. So briefly, I wanna introduce what we'll be speaking about and then I'm gonna hand it over to Stu to start his wonderful presentation. So through this workshop, they're really gonna highlight the different approaches to civic engagement and resistance in the Holocaust. And so I'm gonna hand it over to Stu and thank you so much for joining us. Hi everyone, thanks so much for coming. Uh, I, this is gonna be the most challenging part for me is somehow to figure out how to share my screen with the rest of you. So please bear with me here. I'm gonna give it a shot. Uh, and, uh, oh, that looks like it may, it may work. Um, oh boy. I just had it, as you guys can attest. All right, here we go. Uh, okay, I'm hopeful that you can see my screen, uh, it, and I hope you can uh, for sure. Uh, anyway, so what, what we what we were going to talk about today is while there are clearly similarities in terms of um, the approach that each each one of these people uh, have. Um, utilized in terms of civic engagement, there are some distinct differences as well. And uh, so hopefully we can uh, uh, point those out as we move along. So my, my uh, for, good fortune is to be able to talk about one of the real heroes of the Holocaust, Jan Korzak. Uh, and you can see here uh, what Pope uh, John Paul II thought of him uh, as a true symbol uh, of religion and morality. So when we talk about uh, teaching courageous civic engagement in Holocaust and genocide studies, I think the essential question is, what is courage? And I, I try and uh, uh, convince my students that they are all heroes in waiting, that they all are simply waiting for that opportunity to demonstrate their courage and their heroism. And I promise them, that there will be a moment in time when that happens. Hopefully it won't be at, to the extreme uh, as uh, the kinds of uh, things we talk about in class, but even, even the more simpler moments uh, of daily life in, in terms of uh, heroism. Um, and I think that uh, the key issue here is how can we find ways to help our students embrace this notion of courageous empathy. How can we get students, how can we get them to participate 
uh, both uh, actively uh, in a community way and in their own lives, uh, treating people that uh, with the kind of uh, humility and uh, empathy that we need. Um, I think the, the key point is, and that's why I think Jan Korzak is such a wonderful example of this, that if we can identify leaders, uh, those who seem to be models of moral and civic leadership, they can help our students. And I believe they can help them in these four ways. They can help students lead lives of unbending principle. I believe they can help our students lead lives of integrity, to lead lives of nobility, and arguably most importantly, to lead lives of courageous empathy. Um, how we begin to memorialize uh, these events and these people is a challenge that memorial artists have taken on uh, with, with uh, great creativity and uh, in my mind, uh, just tremendous brilliance. Uh, the, what we're looking at there for, uh, is on the right, that uh, 50 foot hand that extends out of the ground is the uh, Holocaust Memorial in, in Miami. And uh, these figures here, this figure, these figures, it's called the last goodbye. They are also situated at the Holocaust Museum in Miami. Um, you can see figures crawling up the arm here it's, uh, it's always an interesting discussion with students as to whether they see this as a hopeful or a hopeless aspect of this um, memorial. Um, and it really does come down to this question of can a memorial or a monument tell a story both completely and or accurately? How can we memorialize these people that we believe can be models of civic uh, uh, empathy and, and, and do it in a way that's accurate and appropriate. Um, there is an unintended consequence of memorials. Might they make viewers more passive relative to the event or the person that is being remembered? Might it be easier to forget the event? Um, and uh, here's another memorial. This is uh, at the... Uh, uh, outside of outside of Berlin, this is the memorial that leads to these tracks here, uh, track 17, uh, the track that most Jews of Berlin left to travel east. You can see the memorial here, by the way, just just for interest. Uh, you can walk up and down this track. It's very long, and you can see here it tells you on the 9th of December 1942, a thousand Jews transferred from Berlin to Auschwitz. So all along the track, you see this information and you can see how the numbers increase and then how they dwindle away when there are virtually no Jews left. This is the, uh, the thesis uh, often of memorials and it, uh, James Young is really the, the person who has really uh, written some seminal works on this. And he says, once we assign monumental form to memory, we have to some degree divested ourselves of the obligation to remember. So the goal of, uh, artists, whether they be memorial artists, similar to what you see in this picture, whether they be uh, uh, painters, musicians, illustrators, uh, all have this same challenge to make the visitor remember the event and not leave it up to the memorial. This uh, memorial here is the uh, memorial to Korzak at Yad Vashem. This is the memorial of Korzak at the Jewish cemetery in Warsaw. Um, so, uh, when we start thinking about Korzak, we often think immediately about the, uh, the most heroic, noble deed that he, he was uh, responsible for. But there is so much more to this person that we should know about. He, um, he's going to found two orphanages. Um, he is going to become a doctor. He's going to go to medical school. Uh, and of course, he will be a pediatrician. He will study to be a pediatrician. His love of children, his devotion to children, was a lifelong affair for Korzak. Uh, and you can see his writings about children education uh, have been translated into many languages. Um, he says in his uh, diary that he's not here to be loved, uh, but to act 
and love. And it is not the duty of people to help me, but it is my duty to look after the world and the people in it. It is a, somewhat of a, of a tragedy that uh, his death and the way he dies seems to overwhelm and obscure the rest of his life, which was absolutely brilliant. Um, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more, just a little more biography here. He was from an assimilated family. His, uh, the name he was born with was uh, Henrik Goldschmidt. And, uh, he is, and when the first time he uh, writes something for publication, he uses the pseudonym uh, Jan Korzak. Uh, and uh, he has a lot of responsibility early in life. His father's gonna die when he's a young man and he feels responsible for the family. He goes to study medicine. As I said, he becomes a pediatrician. Uh, interestingly, he serves in the uh, 1905 Russo-Japanese War, and uh, he comes out of, the, out of that war, and he decides that he would have a more lasting impression and contribution to the world as a, as a teacher. Uh, and uh, not that anybody needs any additional reasons to uh, think of Korzak as a beloved figure, but that to me has always been something that uh, has resonated with me. Uh, and uh, he can see he... Uh, uh, joins the Orphans Aid Society in 1908. And uh, in 1910, he's going to meet Stefania Wilshinska, who is going to be his right-hand person for the rest of their lives. He is going to start the uh, orphanage in uh, Warsaw in 1911-1912, Dom Sirat. And uh, his, uh, you can see here all of the various things that he does uh, throughout his life. Here's a, here's a picture of, of Korjak and Stefa together. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what year this is, uh, but um, uh, they, it, it's, uh, he was sort of the philosopher of the group, the, the, the visionary of the group, and Stefa really was the nuts and bolts uh, person of action in the group. Uh, she, will be, uh, she will be a part of the... Um, uh, march to the Umschlag plots with Korjak and the children. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in just a little bit as well. Uh, he, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with his uh, educational philosophy, but uh, to suggest that he was ahead of his time is putting it mildly. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, but he creates what amounts to, for all intents and purposes, a republic. Uh, a, a place where children are going to be intimately involved in what happens to them in their school. He's going to create laws and a court. There will be uh, children who will be defense attorneys, children who will be prosecuting attorneys, teachers who will be defendants. Uh, it is very, very progressive. Uh, he has his own radio show. He is known throughout Poland. He's a relatively well-known figure throughout Poland. He's considered the old doctor. Uh, and uh, he writes about what it's like to be a child in an adult world. Um, the uh, quote that a lot of people are familiar with is uh, that children are not the people of tomorrow, but rather are people of today. Um, and I, I think Sarah is going to post uh, my emails. If anybody's interested in getting uh, in taking having this uh, this uh, slideshow, I'm more than happy to share it with you. Um, so uh, World War II is going to break out. Uh, the number in the children of uh, the number of children in the orphanage is, go is obviously going to increase as families are separated for a variety of reasons. Uh, uh, Korzak is going to be forced to bring the orphanage inside the ghetto once it is sealed. And um, because of his fame, Korzak has many opportunities to um, escape to the Aryan side. And um, not surprisingly, uh, he will not abandon his children under any circumstances. Uh, and he's, he is repeatedly given this opportunity, by the way, to, to escape and survive and he refuses to accept it. Um, again, an, uh, I don't know if any of you have read this, The Book of Aaron. It, was, it came out a few years ago. It's a historical novel, but uh, Korshak plays a significant role in that, and you do get to uh, learn a little bit more about, about Korshak in that book. I would, I would highly recommend it. I, I, I enjoyed it very much. 
Uh, but he would go, uh, even when he wasn't well, and he was not a physically a well man at this point, uh, he would go from door to door trying to uh, acquire food and whatever else the children might need, clothes, pillows, blankets, medicine, and so on. Um, he would do plays every week. They would do a play every uh, a concert almost every Saturday. Uh, people from, uh, even some people from outside the ghetto would come and, and listen and hear these plays uh, and uh, enjoy them very much. It is one of the, I think one of the things that to me is most compelling about this personality is that with all that was going on inside and outside the Warsaw Ghetto, with the, with the seemingly loss of morality, uh, the loss of ethical behavior, with all of that, he still is trying to educate the children in the orphanage with honesty and truth. Um, he does, he will write a diary that will be published in 1958. It's, um, uh, although it, it really is worth reading uh, and uh, I would urge you to do it. I think one of the things about the diary, I, I do believe it will affect how you operate in a classroom. I think it, it removes some of the landmines that we often find. Uh, students uh, in an unhealthy kind of competition with each other, for example. So th this is just uh, an extraordinary document uh, as from an extraordinary human being. And then we come to the, the, the moment that most people are aware of, uh, 5 of August, uh, 1942. Uh, and he is going to uh, dress the 200 or so students in their best clothes. Each one is going to have a, a backpack uh, and depending upon their age, they would either have their favorite book or their favorite toy with them. Uh, about 200 children plus the staff, including um, uh, Stefa, will be marching from the orphanage to the Umschlagplatz. The Umschlagplatz is the transit point in Warsaw uh, where uh, you, they will be getting on the train and will then uh, travel for an hour or so to the slaughterhouse Treblinka. Uh, there is a memorial at the Umschlag plots today. Um, it's it's a it, it's a harrowing place to visit. Uh, so this march, uh, as you can see, uh, to the uh, to the train was an organized wordless protest against the murder. Um, here again is uh, this is a. Uh, uh, a part of that memorial of Korzak in the um, in the Jewish cemetery in Warsaw. Uh, this is a quote from one of the people watching this march, uh, and uh, you can read that on your own. Even at this late date, once they get to the trains in Warsaw, one of the uh, uh, SS officers recognizes. Korzak and says, and you know, I read your books when I was a child. And I can still get you out, even at this late date, I can get you to the Aryan side. And even when it was clear as to what was going to happen, Korzak was uh, unwilling uh, to leave the children, even at that point. Um, and this is just uh, the road uh, to uh, Treblinka. Um, here, you can, uh, when I was in uh, Warsaw with the other teachers, uh, we walked the path of Korzak. Uh, we started at this memorial on the right, uh, and um, we then walked uh, across to where the orphanage is today still. You can see the memorial to Korzak there. Uh, we then walked to the, uh, the Jewish cemetery in Warsaw, and then we traveled to Auschwitz, uh, excuse me, to uh, Treblinka, which uh, I'll show you a little bit in just a little, uh, a little while. Um, and uh, his children now, there were some survivors. They weren't all at the orphanage uh, when, when they were being liquidated. Uh, some had left earlier and uh, they only have the most wonderful things to say about him. Uh, they talk about how warm, kind and loving he was. 
uh, how uh, his sense of humor, his smile, and his blue eyes. Here are some quotes. The, the two bottom ones to me seem to resonate the most, especially talking about how he had this sort of innate ability to touch a child's soul. And again, with all that was going on inside and outside the ghetto, uh, Korzak is pushed and pushes uh, the children to believe that man, uh, humans are basically good. Um, he sort of ends his diary by asking, my life has been difficult but interesting. In my younger days, I asked God for precisely that. Um, one of the, um, uh, the Ishak Belfer is a survivor of the Holocaust and an artist. And uh, he writes, and you can, this is, I, I think it's pretty understandable. How does one put on paper or in a drawing or in an illustration or on a monument or in a, 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 a musical piece, how can you, how can that express the absolute hatred of those times? And I think Belfort um, struggles with that. And I, I bring up Isaac Belfort because if, uh, for some of you who may not know, all of those illustrations that we have seen previously were done by Itzhak Belfer. And Belfer was a part of the orphanage with Korzak in the, in the 30s, for a good part of the 1930s. Um, and he is going to, uh, one of the other things uh, I think this, uh, that is interesting here is that when you start looking at a, at a personality like Korzak, there are so many different ways we as teachers can go. You can look at, talk about the events in the Warsaw Ghetto. You can talk about uh, the, the um, horrifying experiences of uh, Treblinka how, uh, why nobody even wanted to talk about Treblinka until 1960. Um, what it was like for, uh, for people in the ghetto. Um, what happens in, during the rebellion, uh, the uprising in, in Warsaw. There are so many different ways uh, to go with this. Uh, and I, I think that's what makes uh, Korzak such a, a, a fascinating character for us to incorporate into our classrooms. Um, a Belfort is going to be a part of Korzak school for, as you can see there, 3038. He's going to ultimately escape and then wind up uh, in uh, Israel in 1949, a very good year, 1949. Um, and if you talk about the rights of the child, I want to move along here. Uh, these are some of the rights of the child that, that the principles that uh, Korzak speaks to, uh, just think, the child has the right to fail. Uh, I, I try and keep that uppermost in my mind very often here at school, especially at a place like Avon, where nobody in Avon clearly, is, you know, everybody in Avon is above average, of course. So uh, it becomes problematic for anybody to fail. Um, the child has a right to respect for his secrets. A child has the right to a lie, a deception, a theft. Uh, all of these uh, philosophies are, are, are so far ahead of their time uh, and worth all of us considering. Um, when it comes to memory, uh, how do we memorialize somebody like Korzak so students can learn about his uh, approach to civic engagement? Uh, this is just the symbolic tracks. This is not the real tracks, obviously, to, to Auschwitz. Here is the memorial to Auschwitz. It is the most uh, haunting and haunted place I've ever been. Not that I've been that many places, but, but certainly uh, this one is, uh, is hard to describe unless you've stepped on the grounds. Uh, it is 17,000 shards of granite, all in different shapes and sizes, jumbled together, looking like uh, some weird cemetery. Uh, there's only one name that has a stone on any, uh, there's only one stone that has a name on it, and that is uh, the name Janos Korzak. That was me in 2016 um, at Treblinka. Um, and this is the last slide. I, I think that, I, so uh, the person that you see on the, on the left, 
uh, Abby Weiner. Abby, uh, I got to know Abby uh, extraordinarily well. Uh, I think about him every day. He passed away a few years ago. He was a Holocaust survivor, um, grew up with Ellie Wiesel, uh, a very similar experience to Wiesel's. Um, he went, this picture was taken when he went back to visit Auschwitz in, in 2001. Um, and he was the greatest teacher I've ever had. Uh, and I share this with you because he was indeed a model of moral and virtuous uh, civic engagement. And I, I show this to you because I think students can be on the lookout for people in their own world who are models of virtue and morality and ethical behavior. It doesn't only have to be people like a Korshak, although certainly that is somebody to consider. There may be, and I'm guessing there are people around them and our students where they can uh, point to those people too as models. Abby was certainly that for me. Uh, it's one of the reasons I haven't retired. I, I, I feel this obligation and uh, um, I miss him every day. Um, and the picture on the right is uh, we were at uh, Birkenau in 2016 and you can see the stone here. Uh, we were asked by uh, a survivor in West Hartford to uh, when we were visiting to put this stone, she had lost her father at, at Birkenau. And uh, if we would put the stone somewhere and the whole, you know, the whole damn place is a graveyard. And so we decided to put it there and we took that picture of it. And uh, so I will, uh, I will stop sharing here and uh, uh, hopefully there'll be some, I'm sure there will be some uh, interesting questions and uh, I look forward to those and I'll turn it over to David. Okay, so I will go right to my presentation currently. And uh, I would, uh, yeah, thanks very much, Stu. I, I really, uh, I like the uh, uh, an early part of your presentation. I like the whole presentation, but I liked an early part and I didn't take notes fast enough. This idea of mo models of courageous empathy. So uh, I, uh, so I wanted to try to welcome everyone and uh, if you have heard me talk about variant fry before, maybe repetition is a good thing, and you'll uh, think of ways in which you I can improve uh, the presentation or things you'd like to, more things you'd like to know. You could let me know. Um, and uh, also, I wanted to thank uh, Sarah Snyder, who's the director of the Hero Center and uh, at Voices of Hope. For organizing the 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 workshops, the the, the brilliant workshop she gave last week, uh, and uh, the one today, and then the one next week, which we'll we'll talk about at the end. Um, and you know, thanks again to uh, to Stu, who actually I don't know if he remembers, he came to my class in 2011 at Southern. That was just a philosophy of education class, but we were discussing uh, Holocaust and genocide education, mainly Holocaust education. So Stu's been doing great work for a long time. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna talk about uh, Barry and Fry, and uh, I've gotta go through the same process of trying to bravely share my screen here. Here, here we go. Uh, go to the slideshow, how's that? Okay, and uh, the one one theme I'd like to emphasize, I suppose, that is that I'm I'm hoping this will be relevant for Connecticut teachers and students because Fry uh, eventually lived in Connecticut and and uh, died in Connecticut, and coming back to Stu's uh, discussion of memorials, it's it's uh, you know I'd like to think in the towards the end of the presentation that there are no memorials for Varian Fry in Connecticut. Uh, I, I can identify two, two that are somewhere in the United States, but uh, that's, that's me. And uh, I like to think that these, are, these workshops are presented in the context of the State of Connecticut Public Act uh, uh, 1824 requiring Holocaust and genocide education and awareness. 
as part of the social studies curriculum. I had a conversation with my students today about events that have generated such things. And in our, in our case, I mean, one legislator in Connecticut told me that it was events in Charlottesville in two, in, 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 when, when it was that 2017 or 2018 that generated the passage of this law, which we've been lobbying for for about 10 years. And the other one I, I talked about today was uh, the, uh, the American Nazi party um, planning to march in, in Skokie in the 70s that motivated uh, Illinois to, uh, motivated the creation of a Holocaust museum in Illinois and also Illinois passed the law for Holocaust and genocide education. So thanks to Hero Center, uh, Connecticut Voices of Hope, Connecticut Department of Education and members of the Holocaust and Genocide Education Advisory Committee, Okay, I feel, I feel like I skipped the slide, but it's okay. So we're talking about Varian Fry, who was born in 1907 and passed away in September 1967 in Connecticut in anonymity. This is Fry. And uh, while, while he was on assignment, in Berlin, for the living age, uh, he'd been sent. He'd been sent to on assignment to um, learn what was going on in in Europe and in Germany. He witnessed a, a pogrom. He calls it the first pogrom on the Kurfürstendamm on July fifteenth, nineteen thirty five. And this was transformative for him. It, it, he wrote a historic report about witnessing the pogrom that was published in the New York Times on July seventeenth, nineteen thirty five. And I'm going to have to go here. Sorry. Uh, I like to use this in my classes because it's a kind of, in terms of contemporary education, it's a kind of, you know, ancient historic document, even though it's from 1935. And uh, so students can think about reading the newspaper, which is becoming more and more rare. Uh, in terms of where students get, get their news, we, we think about how the New York Times was a prominent source of news back then. Now it's just one of one of many, now it's a drop in the bucket. But Fry gives his account of having witnessed firsthand this, this pogrom in, in the article. And uh, as you can, I just highlighted a couple of pieces of it. He says, all along the Kurfürsten down, the crowd raised the shout, Yuda. And so this, this is something I talk to my students about to see if they understand what this, what this means. Uh, so he was, he was uh, transformed by this event. And approximately five years later, following the fall of France, he and his colleagues realized that Jewish refugees were trapped in Marseille without identity documents. And the uh, Vichy government refused them exit visas. Uh, further, in, insofar as Article 19 of the Franco-German armistice obliged the French authorities to, quote, surrender on demand, close quote, anyone requested by the occupying German army Fry and his colleagues in New York understood that stateless Jewish refugees seeking safety in Marseille would be or could be apprehended and imprisoned by the French authorities. Uh, this is just the text of the uh, of Article 19. And I'd, I'd be happy to send this uh, PowerPoint presentation to anybody who who's, who'd be interested in, in just having it in their notes. So the French government was obliged to sur surrender on demand all, all Germans named by the German government in France. So they, they, it be, it be, people began to think that this would extend to all, all refugees in, in France and Marseille. And the Jews in France would face as well discriminatory laws analogous to the Nazi Nuremberg laws as early as October, 1940 and risked detention in uh, concentration camps across France, including Les Mis, Gur, and Le Vernet in the south of France. So this is a uh, 
archival document um, about uh, the Jewish laws in France, which uh, Article One is essentially a, a copying of the, the Nuremberg, you know, race laws, and Article Two regards the uh, prohibition of uh, the exclusion from from certain kinds of jobs. So in June 1940, Fry was instrumental in forming and raising funds for the Emergency Rescue Committee, a, com a committee that was a precursor to the International Rescue Committee that exists today, supporting refugees around the world. This is a screenshot of the, of the website of the current organization that uh, is the... Uh, grew out of the the uh, the organization that Fry helped to found. And so in 1940, the Emergency Rescue Committee reached out to Eleanor Roosevelt to seek her support for emergency visas for the refugees to gain entry to the US. But they still needed someone to go to Europe to represent the committee, and no one could be found. So Fry volunteered to go to Marseille as the European representative of the newly formed committee to rescue refugees from arrest and imprisonment in French concentration camps. And as we know now, although he wasn't sure about that then, uh, about for eventual deportation to Auschwitz and other death camps. In the, in the end, there were no other volunteers. So the ERC accepted his offer that you know he volunteered to go. But, uh, and he, since he's the focus of our discussion, it's reasonable for us to reflect on Fry's motivation uh, in other words, what caused him to volunteer? I was thinking about something that Stu said uh, related to, you know, what, what's courage or what makes courage? So I, was th I thought this might be, you know, also might echo that idea that there's something that motivates him. And if we look back, he, he had graduated from Harvard with a degree in classics. Well, and while at Harvard, he co-founded a literary magazine called The Hound and the Horn with fellow student Lincoln Kirstein who uh, is another story, he went on to found the New York City Ballet, uh, Lincoln Kirstein. So this is um, the literary magazine. And he, he graduated in 1931. And after teaching Latin, he accepted editorial positions with Scholastic Magazine, The Living Age, and the Foreign Policy Association. But in, in the foreword to his, his book, Surrender on Demand, Fry wrote that he was motivated to go to Marseille in part because of his love for the work of the artists and intellectuals who were targeted by the Nazis, but especially because he had witnessed the pogrom in the streets of Berlin. So that's the book. And in, 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 the, in the forward to the book, he says, I knew from firsthand experience what defeat at the hands of Hitler could mean. And while I was in Berlin, I witnessed on the Kurfürstendamm the first Great pogrom, he calls it, against the Jews. Now that the same oppression had spread to France, I could not remain idle as long as I had any chance at all of saving even a few of its intended victims. Now, as a result of his mission in Marseille from August 1940 to September 1941, so that's about 13 months, as part of which he rescued over 2,000 predominantly Jewish refugees, Varian Fry was the first American to be recognized as righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem. So brief, briefly, uh, I, I, I could say that he and his team, when he was in Marseille for these 13 months, helped secure forged identity cards and organized escapes over the uh, Pyrenees Mountains into Spain and escaped by boat from Marseille to Martinique and to the US. And he arranged for transit permits across Spain and Portugal, and also sheltered refugees at a villa outside of Marseille and provided many other kinds of material support to refugees. There are some people he couldn't get out of the country, but he supported them. It's just a picture of Fry and Marseille at, at the time. And, uh, Another thing that I think is important about Fry's story uh, is that it, his heroic efforts 
would not have been possible without members of his extended team, including Albert Hirschman, Miriam Davenport, Danny Benedict, Justus Rosenberg, Bill Fryer, Hans, and Lisa Fitko, and others, or without the support of the staff at the American Consulate in Marseille, including Vice Consuls Hiram Bingham the fourth and Miles Standish. So I highlighted Bingham because I wasn't sure how much time I would have today to uh, talk about all of them. But Bingham, uh, seen here, uh, what looks like an identity card, and uh, was a, a, a Connecticut resident, uh, was from a, a prominent Connecticut family. And he, he issued visas to refugees at his own initiative in opposition to consular policy and issued affidavits in lieu of passports. He helped refugees escape concentration camps and sheltered them in his own home in Marseille. Ah, this is an image of a, a affidavit in lieu of, of, of a passport. Uh, you can see, I think maybe you can see on the bottom, it's. Uh, signed by Bingham. And he, while he died in anonymity, in 2002, Bingham was recognized posthumously by Secretary of State Colin Powell with an award, oh, there's a typo, for his constructive dissent. And within a few years after that, a uh, uh, postage stamp was issued in, in his honor. So that's also that's also a story that might be interesting to pursue with students to look look more into the the, the Bingham family and and Harry Bingham's heroism in Marseille. Albert Hirschman was one of Fry's uh, assistants, and it's as I say here, it's difficult to summarize his role, which included everything from collecting blank passports, funneling uh, he, they would get passports from cooperative uh, consulates and and uh, be able to forge them for uh, refugees, funneling funds, working on the escape route over the Pyrenees and interviewing refugees who were seeking Fry's help. And eventually Hirschman escaped himself going over the Pyrenees with the Fitkos and uh, made his way to the US and eventually taught at, Yale, at Berkeley, Yale, Columbia, Harvard and finished at, at Princeton. Miriam Davenport was uh, an American studying art in Paris, who fled to Marseille when Paris was occupied, and she became an, an indispensable part of the team, organizing the office, interviewing refugees, preparing reports for Fry, and renting the villa where the group uh, sheltered refugees at one part of the, the project. The, uh, the, the, the team of Hans and, and Lisa Fitko was extremely important for their success because uh, Lisa and Hans were experts in taking uh, refugees over, over the Pyrenees. They would have, uh, I don't know if I made that clear, but it's, uh, in other words, uh, uh, Fry, Bingham and so forth would help, help secure uh, uh, visas to enter the United States, we say passports and visas, identifications that would allow refugees to enter the United States. But they didn't have anything that would allow them to leave France. So they, so in many cases, they, as I said, they stuck out on the boat or they went over the Pyrenees. So they would take the, the train from Marseille to, uh, Sarbert, you're on the border with Spain, and then go over the, over the climb over the Pyrenees and go to uh, Port Boo before making their way across Spain. This is a close up of the of Sarbert in relation to Port Boo. And there are many, many stories of them uh, bribing uh, border guards with uh, cigarettes to get over to get over the the, the border. Hmm. 
there. Uh, this this is a book by Lisa Fitko, which de details some other efforts to help people escape. Fitko, Hans Fitko, as a German national, was recognized as righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem in 2000. Uh, Eustace Rosenberg, I, 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 I want to mention also, uh, he was, he was, uh, he, he just passed away in uh, last year. He was the youngest member of the team and the, say, the last surviving member of the team. And he, he worked in the office, delivered uh, blank identity cards to the forger, and at least in one case, accompanied a group of refugees over the Pyrenees. And he, he was a professor emeritus at Bard College, um, active interviewing, and, and just up to a, a couple of years ago, publishing his book, The Art of Resistance, My Four Years in the French Underground, which tells many details of his bravery. Now, uh, among those Fry and his team were able to save were included the most distinguished artists, writers, and intellectuals of our time who were being targeted by the Nazis because they were Jewish. And also in many cases, because their art was seen by the Nazis as degenerate. So uh, the, the thing I wanted to try to emphasize now is that this provides a kind of another, another pedagogical track to, to look at at uh, the art that was created and think about why, why they were targeted. But one of the, the prominent artists was Marc Chagall, who Fry wanted to save. And these are just a couple of examples of, of Chagall's artwork. Uh, I went too fast. The Peace Window at the United Nations. Uh, America's Windows created for the Chicago Art Institute, which I managed to see just a few years and the two murals that hang in the Metropolitan Opera in New York uh, from dating from 1966, the triumph of music and the sources of music. So you can, these are visible on the left and the right, far left and right of the atrium, just look at the close up and the, the painting on the ceiling of the Palais Garnier in Paris. So it's something that I think about with my students, you know, that these are works of art that would never have been possible had uh, the Fry and his team had not the Fry and his team saved Mark Chagall. And Chagall was actually uh, arrested for deportation to, to a, a, a camp. And uh, Fry managed to ca call the French police and, and uh, have him freed from detention and then helped him helped him get out. And I think in the interest of time, I'll I'll talk about Lipschitz, who was one of uh, the artists that Fry saved. I'll pause briefly on, on this one. They remained lifelong friends. And of course uh, he saved her. Anna Arendt, the author of this book, uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil, which of course I think everybody knows it began as a, uh, as, as a weekly, uh, I forget what that's, I forget what that's called, sorry, it's, it's a weekly report, you know, in, in the New Yorker, uh, which was later compiled in the book. Andre Masson. Uh, Verfel and Mann are interesting. Ver uh, Verfel, uh, the author of 40 Days and Nights in Musa Da about the Armenian genocide. Heinrich Mann, the brother of Thomas Mann. Well, they, they arrived and they're uh, as a result of being saved by Fry's team and their arrival in New York was published in the New York Times, which helped the Emergency Rescue Committee generate more support. Fuckwanger was much valued, his work was much valued by the Roosevelts and he, he was uh, rescued from a concentration camp 
with the support of Harry Bingham. So part of the uh, part of the story uh, is that as as Fry's work became better known, the uh, uh, the work he was involved in that was essentially illegal or violating the laws of France, such as forging identity cards, providing for illegal passage into Spain, sheltering fugitives, uh, uh, tr transgressed U.S. neutrality at the time. And uh, the U.S. withdrew its support. Uh, this, and uh, there's correspondence between, with, within the Roosevelt administration and with Fry and with his wife that you can access in the FDR library at Marist College. Uh, but this, this is uh, from Sumner Wells in this third paragraph saying, Fry has been directed by his principals in this country to leave France. His uh, activities brought him into contact with various persons who the French police had on their suspect list, list and he was in company with some of those persons when arrested. And uh, for the passport renewal, his passport has, had expired and uh, the passport office re reviewed with Mrs. Fry some of the activities of her husband, which had been from the point of view of the Department of Doubtful Wisdom. She said that those particular extra legal activities were no longer being prosecuted and that now he was in Marseille given relief and so forth. So he, he was being uh, attacked. Uh, he no longer had the support. And this, this uh, letter came from Eleanor Roosevelt to Mrs. Fry, where she said, I'm sorry, there is nothing I can do for your husband. And I, I, I uh, include this because none of this None of this would have been possible without Eleanor Roosevelt's support for the special visa status for the for the refugees in Marseille, Marseille that Fry had helped revain, uh, 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 arrange arrange. So uh, this was a, a real blow, and uh, Fry was ex was forcibly expelled by France, and he, he continued to advocate for refugees, uh, as with this letter to Eleanor Roosevelt. November 18th, 1940, and to report on the scope of the Holocaust in its historic article for the New Republic. Uh, I find that much of what we know about the Holocaust today as, as a general outline is, is included in his, his article in the New Republic from uh, December 21st, 1942. Now, this is a letter from Fry to Eleanor Roosevelt uh, in which he's advocating for the support support for refugees, their situation remains, he says, at least as perilous as it appeared to be on the day the armistice terms were announced. So he, he continued fighting for refugees, writing. And uh, he's eventually, he, he and his family moved to Richfield, Connecticut in 1956. And he, he studied and taught in Connecticut including his last assignment, teaching Greek and Latin at Joel Barlow High School. He died in his sleep, as I say, in anonymity in his home in Connecticut, uh, September 13th, 1967, at the age of 59. And uh, as part of his recognition as righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem on February 4th, 1996, a tree was planted on the Avenue of the Righteous Among the Nations by Fry's son, James, and Secretary of State Warren Christopher. So his story is featured on the Yad Vashem website of uh, the section on the righteous among the nations. And uh, in March 19th, 1996, Fry was recognized in the House of Representatives by Tom Lantos. And then uh, October 15, 2007, the US House of Representatives honored Fry on the hundredth anniversary of his of his birth, uh, but as uh, as I was uh, uh, suggesting earlier, that he, 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 I say there's no there's no memorial or recognition of Fry in the, in the state of Connecticut. 
And uh, it would be interesting to try to work, work on that together as, as, as a group of educators, if someone would be interested uh, in that. Uh, I wanted to point out from uh, a research point of view, I found this really indispensable, this, uh, these selected digitized documents related to the Holocaust and refugees <clears throat> at the Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum. Uh, uh, you can't see the URL there, but uh, for example, when you go in, you can see this, uh, the Eleanor Roosevelt papers, and I, and here about four lines down, you see Vary and Fry, so you can see the correspondence with, with Fry and Eleanor Roosevelt. And these are some of the uh, selected resources that I was making reference to in my uh, brief comments today. Stop sharing the screen. Thank you. I, I think I think one thing that I uh, <clears throat> might it might not come up in questions, but I I, I was thinking about uh, the outcome for Fry, which I for some reason I didn't go into in this uh, presentation, was that when he when he returned to the United States, he suffered from what today we would call PTSD at the time. Uh, this, this, uh, the, the, that diagnosis didn't exist, and I'm not sure the DSM existed. Thinking historically, but he, uh, and he, he writes about this in the unpublished forward of his uh, his book Surrender on Demand, where he says he he wasn't really able to get back into normal life. He thought writing the book about what happened, which was actually published before the end of the war, so uh, he he couldn't use everybody's names because there were still, some of them were still active in France, you know, uh, uh, so, but he really suffered psychologically from, as he says, he was haunted by the ghosts, you know, uh, of the people he couldn't save. All right. Thank you so much, Stu and David. Um, fantastic. Really learned a lot personally. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in chat. We have one that I'm gonna share now. And then in the meantime, if you come up with one you'd like to ask, please put it in there. Um, so Beth asked, how do students, how do you get your students to think, well, those people are extraordinary, but I'm just little me. Um, how can we humanize figures like Fry and Jan? And are there other examples that we could share with our students? Oh, is that for Stu? I think it's for both of you. For both of us. Okay, Stu, you want to go first? You're muted. That's one way to approach it. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you want me to go ahead? Sure. Uh, well, I, I think uh, that's a great question. And I, I feel like I'm, I'm trying to do exactly what you're, you're proposing. And that is trying to humanize Fry throughout throughout the you know uh, when we read him in the class in the sense that he was a, in a, in a sense a, a victim of circumstance you know he he's in Berlin he witnesses the pogrom so he's, you can say what 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 makes him the one person you know who will will agree to go to Marseille because they form the organization they raise money in New York a lot of famous people involved in raising the money but. No one will go, but he he decides to go. Why not? Well, I mean, why does he? Why wasn't everybody else go? Why does he decide to go? And it it has to be that, um, as he says in the uh, in in the forward that, that he he witnessed the program. Uh, there's also he he says that he felt uh, a debt to the artists who who had enriched his life. Uh, so I don't know if that's uh, that's maybe humanizing them to a certain extent, but it's also it's a it's an interesting way to talk about how about values and how someone could value someone uh, feel a debt to someone who would enrich their lives. And when we talk in class about what students today value, it's also I think important that uh, he 
he suffered psychologically. You know, it's not it's unfortunate, but it's important that he suffered psychologically because it means that we're we're human, that uh, the suffering of others affects us, and I think that's something to talk about. Uh, I, I also I also try to tell one last thing I was going to mention Stu is that the uh, uh, we try we try to think about how the time was different for example for Fry which is it's I think it's hard to do first of all the New York Times was was one of a select number of publications and news sources but we also we also talk about things that that I find somewhat amusing to say as I say them but. Uh, they say there was no CNN at the time, for example. There was no, uh, there were no cell phones. You know, he couldn't text anyone. And so sometimes we talk about his correspondence with his, uh, with his wife, that he had, they had to write letters to each other and the, the communications would cross. Uh, so, so that's, a, but I think it's, so I, I feel like I do try to humanize him. I don't know how effective it is, but that's what I think it's a great question. Yeah. Yes, uh, Beth, thank you for asking an impossible question to answer. Um, I, <laughs> I have to admit, I don't, I don't have a really good answer for you. Um, I do think, though, that the, a part of that is the art. The art of teaching this kind of material is humanizing that which is inconceivably dehumanizing. And um, so, for example, uh, when, you, when you look at, at the, the, those that almost 28,000 or whatever it is now uh, that are recognized by the righteous as righteous among the nations. Uh, what you find with most of them is that they didn't really go out seeking to be heroic. Okay. It was when they were act, were, were face to face with the situation and they had to respond. Uh, some of the great uh, those most well-known righteous among the nations are people who, if you look at the truck maze, for example, in Shamban, a woman comes and knocks on her door, and that's how that whole thing starts. She wasn't look, seeking to save Jews. Um, and I think uh, as you drill down a little bit deeper to somebody like Korzak, you can begin to see how it is he is moved towards wanting to work directly with children. Uh, and why he it, it becomes his life's passion, and uh, uh, I, I, so I guess to make a short story long here, but I I really don't have a very good answer for you. But knowing you, my guess is you do a really great job of humanizing these people in a way that students can can find them relatable and relevant to their own lives. Well, I mean, it's hard. Like, I mean, everyone knows Schindler's List, and then. You know, you sort of get those kids. We all those teenagers who are like, "Well, that's that's somebody else." <laughs> um, but I, you know, it's like, "What do you care about? What do you see?" Because I, I remember, Stu, I learned from you. It's like, it's not like, "Oh, back then I would have done this and that." Like, trying to get them to think, "Well, what what are you going to do moving forward?" You've learned about what happened with all the bystanders and whatnot. So, right. what 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 can you do moving forward? What what yeah, as you said, what what do you value and what can you do about it? And, and, you know, that's such a great point, Beth, because when you think about what's going on today in terms of the challenges that we, if we're social studies teachers, face in terms of how we deal with some of the more controversial issues of the day, we, we cannot allow high school to become simply dumping of content. High school cannot become simply content and facts and names and data and formulas. We have students have to be made aware of the challenges that we have faced if they are going to then try and improve the situation. You have to know where, what the problems and challenges are before you can work on getting making them better. So um, it, it really is uh, something that we have to deal with as as uh, teachers who teach the more controversial subjects. But uh, uh, you know, you know, never give up. Never give up. Depending how deep I feel like I want to go into that with my students, there is a story about Fry that he was uh, suspended or expelled from Harvard for a prank. He put a for sale sign on the dean's lawn, and this was back back then seen as rather uh, outrageous. So, 
he had he had to use all of his connections to get back into Harvard. So sometimes people think, well, it was that rebellious side of him, you know, that helped him uh, find ways to to uh, save people in Marseille. That that's interesting. It was a problem. He was by the way, there was one real quick point here about uh, Yad Vashem and the righteous among the nation. Out of the, whatever the number is now, 28,000, there are only five Americans who are recognized. I believe that's right, David. You probably know better than me that there are only five. But the point I wanted to make was that the, the procedure, the process by which people have to go through in order to be recognized as such is an enormously arduous task. I mean, this isn't simply somebody saying, well, you know, this person did a nice thing for me and therefore I think he deserves to be recognized. No, it is way more challenging than that. And uh, there probably are people who, when we were to hear their bios would think, well, of course they should be recognized as one of, and they're not. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's, a, it's really quite a, a feat for someone to uh, be recognized as such. And obviously Fry is a worthy, worthy, uh, receiver of such an award. Yeah, David, your point that um, I'm sure some a lot of us have heard of the witness stones, you know, trying to sort of commemorate, I mean, it's learning from the Germans, right? There's Stuperstein, you know, sort of the, the opposite of that is like, there should be a monument to Fry in Connecticut. Like, let's put, let's put history on, let's make it public. Where did he die? Which community? Um. Oh, gosh, I uh, didn't have that in the slide. Um, uh, maybe I just missed it. Sorry. Let me let me, let me think. Let me think. Uh, well, um, if I was teaching at Barlow High School, I know where I would want to put a monument. He was teaching at Barlow because he was, you know, I just can't think of the name of the town. Um, I could go back. I could go back and look at this. But that would be a great activity or, you know, for... I don't, I don't know a teacher there, but you know, they could sort of turn, um, make it real world to do what you're saying, that it's not just dump and content, like let's go and, okay, Reading, thank you, Jose. Um, Rich, I have Richfield, is that like Reading? I don't know, but that would be a neat project. I, I know that my school, we're working on installing a witness stone for an enslaved woman right here in Suffield and you know, yes. it's, Suffield's a really white um, town, and <clears throat> there's been, you know, some heated discussions. Let's put it mildly, like, why do we want to air the dirty laundry? It's like, no, we 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 need to look and confront our history. So there's, there's a little plaque in the town that he was born in in New Jersey, and then uh, there's a a plaque in in Skokie. There's outside the museum in Skokie. There's a kind of uh, fountain. And a, a wall with the, the names of the righteous, mm -hmm. uh, but 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 nothing in Connecticut. And I thought about uh, trying to encourage someone to to name a room in the library at Southern after him, or perhaps it could be named it could be named after Fry and Bigham, for example. Uh, uh, so that would be something to look into. Or there might be something that the Connecticut legislature could do the way the House of Representatives at least reads read something on the floor. But that's some that would probably be a group project. I was working with a couple of people, uh, seems like five or 10 years ago on this. And we had we had some ideas. I think they were and they were meeting separately with Eustace Rosenberg at, at Bard. But uh, but nothing ever came of it. But it's a it's a. Stu reminded me of it because of his really interesting uh, comments about memorials in the beginning. And uh, I know about the the Schoperstein, of course, but there's the uh, uh, it, it was started in Connecticut. It started in Guilford, didn't it? Witness stones, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, you, we, I know a lot of us know about the story of Irina Sendler. You know, the, you know that was a history day sort of project. These students like earthed up. And she had been sort of overlooked. And then that's an incredible story. You know, just straying away for a second from Holocaust and genocide studies, uh, I have found uh, a, a, I, it's, it's worked well for me anyway. And that is having students create memorials and monuments uh, for a variety of things. I wasn't sure how to deal with January 6th uh, this, this year. 
And I decided after doing a little bit of research with the kids and having them listen to uh, some interviews with Michael Fanone, I had them uh, create Ooh. a memorial to January 6th. And they had to decide um, where it was going to be placed, uh, from what perspective it would be taken, whether it be the victims, whether it be the police, whether it be the perpetrators, whether it be the bystanders. Um, uh, how would they do something to make the visitor responsible for remembering what happened January 6th? And how relevant would their memorial be in 5, 10, 20, 50 years from now? Uh, mm -hmm. One example was uh, this one student uh, was going to create this metal American flag that was going to be torn down the, the, the horizontal way, the long way, and it was just going to be held together by threads. And um, his thinking was that uh, even after January 6th, our democracy was hanging on by a thread and that because it was still hanging on as minimally as it was, there was still hope that it could be repaired. Um, and this was just a, it was kind of an interesting assignment. Kids, kids were great. Kids just very creative. So. Thank you. Um, I want to see if there are any other questions before we continue on. If not, um, I would love to follow up with you all and talk about the idea of starting a memorial. I think that's a fantastic way of honoring him and also obviously a very local idea. So I think students would be a wonderful way to, to get that ball rolling. Hmm. Uh, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna wrap this up and then um, follow up with everybody. I will send the recording. Um, and also I wanna make you aware that there is another workshop that's gonna be coming up next week. And it's also gonna be David. Um, and it is called Inquiry-Based Strategies for Addressing the Genocide in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, and I will place our website in the chat. So if you'd like to register for that, you can go to that website. And then David, did you wanna talk briefly about the other workshop that you're involved with? Oh yes, I just thought it would be a good time to to mention that the, the uh, history department at, at Southern is going to host a workshop uh, on March 2nd um, at one o'clock with Lucy, Lucy Adlington, uh, where she, uh, who will talk about her book, um, The Dressmakers of Auschwitz. And uh, uh, this is sort of maybe related to the, the workshop that, that uh, Sarah presented. Uh, I, I wonder if they have in, in the archive at, at Auschwitz, if they have any of these dresses, if any of these artifacts survived. But so that would be something that uh, if, you, if you're interested, uh, you could contact me or contact Sarah. And uh, there, oh, there's, there's my email there, or you can find me, that's my Gmail. You can find me at Southern. And uh, it's, I know it's the one o'clock is not a convenient time, but uh, hopefully we'll record that and be able to share it with teachers.